All right, good morning, everyone. So we are moving along to Gauss's Law, and we're kind of going back a little bit um, in terms of the order of the chapters in the textbook. All right, so chapter 24 uh, is where we're going today, and we will do Gauss's Law today and on Monday. Your homework for Gauss's Law will be due next Friday, uh, the same day that we have our midterm, which will cover... 26, 27, 28, and 24, Gauss's Law. Your homework for Gauss's Law next Friday, and uh, uh, that's also when we'll have the midterm. All right, so Gauss's Law. <coughs> what is Gauss's Law, and how does it relate to what we've been doing so far? So today we're going to talk about the concepts of symmetry, uh, the concept of electric flux, and uh, Gaussian surfaces. Okay. <coughs> So symmetry is a very important principle in physics. Uh, it's a very highly sophisticated uh, mathematical theory. There are theories of symmetry. We're going to use some basic ideas of symmetry uh, to basically help us learn more about the electric fields of certain charge distributions. So the picture on the screen is an example of a charged wire. charged straight wire and we've already found the electric field due to a long straight wire and we found that it was radial. Right? The electric field was radial the outwards. And you can see that this electric field is basically causing <coughs> variations to the shape and color of uh, some blood plasma, right? So you can kind of see the sh how that blood plasma is arranging itself around the wire reflects the symmetry of the electric field. The electric field we'd say would be radially symmetric. Um, it points, it points uh, in the radial uh, direction. Okay, so this concept of symmetry is going to be helpful here. So let's talk a little bit more about what is symmetry. So we can learn a lot about electric fields simply based on the symmetry of the charge distribution. So let's say we didn't know anything about Coulomb's law but we knew that charged objects talk to each other, we could ask what must the electric field of a long wire look like, just based on the principles of symmetry, even if we don't know the underlying uh, law. So that leads to another question in terms of, you know, there could be such a thing as good symmetry or uh, bad symmetry, uh, different degrees of symmetry. Now, there's very math mathematically, there's very precise languages for talking about continuous symmetries, discrete symmetries. Uh, we're mostly going to look at continuous symmetries, which are going to be helpful uh, for Gauss's law here. So, charge distributions with a high degree of symmetry, um, <coughs> the symmetry of the electric field must match the symmetry of the charge distribution. So, this is uh, what I claim here, and we'll try to reason why that uh, makes sense here. So important symmetries that we'll look at is some of the well some of the basic shapes we've looked at in this class so far, planes or planar symmetry, uh, cylindrical symmetry, and uh, spherical symmetry. So so far this is just terminology, but let's talk a little bit about what this really means. So cylindrical symmetry does, would be let's consider a cylinder that is infinite in length, um, and if I take that cylinder and I perform various operations on it, uh, it will look the same to us, right? So a very, very long cylinder, it has a number of different uh, continuous symmetries. One of those symmetries would be what we call uh, translation symmetry. Basically what that means if I, if I take the cylinder, right, and uh, you're looking at the cylinder and I put a blindfold on you, and then I tug the cylinder like that, and I take the blindfold off you and I tell you, what did, I, did anything happen? You would say, well, it looks the same. 
Right? You can't tell that it's translated to the left or to the right. So that's called translation symmetry. So the electric field of the cylinder can't depend on where you are along the length of the cylinder or along the axis of the cylinder. That's called translation symmetry. Okay, and in fact, translation symmetry has very important consequences in physics. Um, translation symmetry leads to what we call actually conservation of momentum. And that's basically if I take an experiment and on this table right here and I do that same experiment down the hall or I do it on another campus on the East Coast, right, I should get the same results. So <coughs> translational symmetry leads to various, what we call conservation laws in physics. Um, all right, now, so here's translation symmetry just pertaining to the symmetry of the charge distribution. Now, there's also another symmetry called rotation symmetry, because if I blindfolded you again, and I rotated that cylinder by a certain angle, took the blindfold off and you looked at it, it would look the same, so we'd say it has rotation symmetry. Not rotation symmetry about any axis, but about the axis, about the, uh, the axis that goes right through the center. Okay, that's, this, that's the middle one here, rotation symmetry, and then there are a few different other symmetries we could identify. One would be a reflection symmetry, basically, you know, looking at the cylinder in a mirror, for example. I, uh, you would see uh, the same thing um, in the mirror when you're looking at it. Now, that plane of reflection is cutting through the axis of the cylinder, but you could really turn that plane to be any plane as long as it goes through the center. So that's what we'll call reflection symmetry. And there's, there's more than one reflection symmetry. I mean, that's a whole continuous group because you can rotate that plane in any direction. And then there is another reflection symmetry that would be on uh, perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. And again, that plane, if it's really an infinite cylinder, could be moved any direction, this way or that way. So there's a high degree of symmetry, what we say, uh, in this cylinder. That if we perform any of these operations, translation, rotation, reflection, uh, the chart, the cylinder looks the same. So we say it's invariant under any of these operations or it just doesn't change. So since the cylinder has a high degree of symmetry, these symmetries are continuous. The electric field, which is generated by the cylinder if the cylinder is charged, must also have the same symmetry as the underlying charge distribution, right? So even if we don't know the law of physics, that governs, let's say, we don't, let's say we didn't know Coulomb's law, we could say, I know what the field would have to look like just because of the, the shape of the charge distribution. So these have, symmetry arguments have been very important in the history of physics, in particular the last hundred years, um, have led to discoveries of new particles and elementary particle physics, and the search for symmetry and beauty and elegance in the laws of physics have uncovered new laws. All right, so, Let's talk a little bit more about cylindrical symmetry. Is here's an end view of the cylinder. And let's say you just wanted to guess what the electric field looked like, and you kind of guessed some, uh, what would you describe that pattern to be? So what was that? Pinwheel. Um, what kind of mill? Pinwheel. Pinwheel, pinwheel. All right, thank you. All right, now. Why is the pinwheel field, why couldn't that be the field of the cylinder? Yes? Because it doesn't all like start at the same point or end up from the same point. Kind of like some of them are off axis a little bit. Okay, so if I took that, uh, if I performed an operation on this cylinder, here we're looking down the length of the cylinder and I reflected it about a plane that uh, bisect that goes through the axis of the cylinder, you reflect it right, you get a field that looks different. But to your, the charge distribution, which is this line like this, looks exactly the same, so the field would have to be invariant under that reflection as well. So that pinwheel pattern there wouldn't be invariant. It looks different when you reflect it, but the cylinder, the charge itself looks the same so what we say is 
you know, that, that can't be that. That, that couldn't be the electric field. It couldn't have that shape just because it doesn't match the symmetry of the cylinder itself. Okay, so these are, these are some of the arguments related to symmetry. This is called uh, radial symmetry. All right, some other basic symmetries. So the middle one that we've looked at so far is cylindrical symmetry. And, you know, this principle, which we'll also add on here, called the superposition principle, which we've been using to, uh, when we... We're kind of going back to electric fields now and kind of looking at them from a different perspective. But uh, if I look at uh, you know, the electric field, as we've seen, obeys this superposition principle, which just means the total field is the net sum of all the individual charges that make up that field. So if I have a long cylinder, I can make various uh, nested cylinders. And this, this combination right here, this coaxial cable, uh, which is used, you know, through for telecommunication. That has cylindrical symmetry, right? It still has cylindrical sy symmetry because it's just nested cylinders. So, what are some other symmetries that you can look at? Well, spherical symmetry, meaning basically, if I look at that sphere right there, what are the symmetries that you see in that sphere? What are some symmetries in that sphere? Basically, changes that leave it invariant. Yes, Carson. It's symmetric on all axes and planes. Symmetric on all axes under rotation or reflection or translation. Uh, rotation. Yeah, you could rotate it about any axis that goes through the center of the sphere. It would be um, invariant under rotations about any axis through the center. It would also be invariant about any reflection through a plane that goes through the center as well. But it doesn't have translation uh, uh, symmetry, does it? Yeah. All right, so and then what about the plane? What kind of, <coughs> so you could, again, for the sphere, you could have concentric spheres. Now what about for the plane? What kind of symmetries exist for the, and I'm considering a really, really large plane, right? Not one that has corners, yes. Rotation around the axis. Around a normal axis. Okay, so rotation about any kind of normal axis would leave it invariant because you can't see the corners. It's really, really big. Um, translation along the like along the infinite plane. So translation symmetry, you could again, I could tug the sheet and you wouldn't know that it was tugged. So the electric field created by the plane would have to be independent of where you are along the surface of the plane because you can't see the edges, right? Any other symmetries? Uh, yes. Is that perpendicular reflection symmetry? Perpendicular reflection. So you could put a you could put a plane like this, and you could reflect it as long as it's the plane is uh, uh, at right angles to the charge. It would be symmetric about those reflections. All right. Excellent. So any so these are the basic symmetries that we'll look at, right? But um, any the field has to also have the same symmetry as as uh, the charge distributions here. Okay, so and you can see we've, um, you know, so for the plane you can build a capacitor by taking the positive and negative, and that's just going to be the superposition principle of two planes that have these uh, symmetries associated with them. All right, so take out your voting cards. And what I'd like you to do, as you're taking out your voting cards, I'm going to read the question to you. And I'm going to give you well, 30 seconds or so to prepare your vote individually. So a uniformly charged rod has a finite length, L. The rod is symmetric under rotations about the axis and reflection in any plane containing the axis. It is not symmetric under translations or under reflections in a plane perpendicular to the axis unless the plane bisects the rod. Which field shape or shapes match the symmetry uh, of the rod? So there could be more than one uh, correct answer here. Um, so take a moment and notice the picture here. One gives the side view and one gives the end view.
Get ready to prepare your votes. All right, and on the count of three, let's show our votes. If you want to show more than one color, you can do that. So three, two, one. All right, so take 30 seconds. Try to convince your neighbor which one or which ones could possibly represent the symmetry of the start out um, in terms of, uh, now which one, let's try to rule one out that couldn't be. So can someone uh, tell me which one couldn't be a possible? Yes. It can't be B because it has to be symmetrical across the vertical axis. So if I reflected the rod about a plane through the center, of the rod, now the field would be stronger at this side, so this one can't be B. Can't be B. All right, does B break any other symmetries other than the reflection about the center? All right, well, let's rule out B. All right, are there any others here we can rule out? Yes. Okay, so it would change the direction that the field is circulating. Um, so that couldn't be true. Now, does, does E break any other symmetries? What about rotation symmetry through uh, uh, the axis? If you rotate it a little bit, you know, uh, now at the top, the field might be uh, a bit of an, actually, <laughs> Um, actually, I'm not, I don't think that one's actually true, now that I, now that I said it out loud. <laughs> right. Are there any other, does anyone see any other <coughs> symmetries that it might be breaking? Uh, yes. Well, it says that it's not symmetric in the translations, and that one is. So if you, like, move it, it's going to be the same. Well, that just means, you, yeah, if you move it so this way. It can't be that one, because in this it says it's not. So for for uh, uh, translations. So does this field depend on where the rod is located? 
Well, so, yeah, so none of them have uh, uh, translation symmetry in that sense. Is there any others we can rule out? Uh, yes. C. C. Because okay. for the, the same reason, when you rotate, like the field isn't coming uniformly off of the, uh, the, like the long view. So if you were to like uh, flip that, it would have a different are you referring to this picture or this one? That one. This one. All right, so kind of similar to that, uh, that pinwheel earlier. It's kind of, the field is not totally radial. So if you were to reflect it about a plane that bisects the axis, uh, or, <coughs> intersect, or you know, intersects the axis, it wouldn't um, be symmetric about that. All right, so any others we can roll out? All right, so it's got to be some A and D. Uh, it could be A or D. Uh, if we didn't know anything about electric field, you know, uh, uh, it could be uh, A or D. All right, <clears throat> now the next concept I want to introduce here. So this is symmetry. So why is symmetry uh, <coughs> useful? Well, symmetry is useful because it's going to allow us to calculate the electric field in a, in a, in a simpler way than would otherwise than we'd otherwise be able to. So before we do that. Before we <coughs> do that, we're going to talk about uh, flux. And <coughs> I'm going to put electric in brackets here because, you know, any vector field has a flux. And flux, the concept of flux is just a measure of the degree to which a field penetrates through a surface. So imagine I had a big hoop, right? And I take that hoop, and there's a river that's flowing. I take that hoop, and I dip it into the river. If we were to measure the number of cubic meters of water that flows through that hoop every second, that would be an, a measure of the water flux through the hoop. Now, what are some factors that the water flux is going to uh, depend on? So we're imagining. Imagine dipping a hoop into a stream. <clears throat> well, some of the factors that the flux will depend on is, can someone give me a factor that will kind of measure the, you know, the amount per unit of time <coughs> that's flowing through the hoop? Yes? The area. So the flux, so it's going to depend on area of hoop. Good, and what other factors? Yes? The speed of the water. Speed. So if the, if the water is going, if, if the water is not moving at all, there's no flow, right? Nothing's going to make it through. Any other factors? Yes? The, the way that the water, like the consistency of the water and behavior. What do you mean by that? So like it could be like its viscosity or its density. <clears throat> Might have something to do with it. Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand what you mean by that. So in a sense, if we're just measuring how much moves by, let's say, you know, instead of water, it was honey, right? But if the honey is all flowing through, you know, if it's still flowing, after a certain amount of time, there's going to be a certain amount of honey that uh, has, has kind of gone through the loop, right? Or if you're pouring honey into a container, right, it's still, you know, um, if it's not flowing as quickly, it's, there's going to be less flux, right? So really, uh, uh, that, so I, I think that, that is really related to the speed. Um, the viscosity is kind of related to how fast it ends up going. Uh, yes? Angle? Uh, angle of what? Uh, the angle of the loop relative to, like, the, the flow, because if it's like parallel, nothing could be flowing through that loop. Okay, very good. So orientation. Yeah, we'll add orientation. Right, because if I dipped the hoop in parallel to the flow, nothing would go through the hoop at all. It doesn't matter how fast it was going. Um, it doesn't matter how big your loop is. You know, if you're not catching, if you're not catching any fish, just turn the, you got to turn the hoop a little bit. So. <coughs> 
Now, here is a, I'm going to sketch this. Let's consider this to be a top view. And kind of looking down, and from the top, looking down on the hoop, and this is kind of a square hoop. Okay, so if it's at an angle, what we're going to say is, uh, so I'm imagining it kind of goes out like this here, right? Now, I'm going to define the uh, area vector. It turns out area is actually a vector, and it's a vector that is perpendicular to the uh, surface of the loop itself. Okay. Now, so now the angle here between the hoop and the flow we'll call theta. So let's define the water flux, the capital phi sub w, to be, well, to kind of take into all those factors here, we want to know how fast it's going, you know, v. Uh, the orientation of the loop is going to have something to do with theta, and then the area is going to have something to do with a. So if I do some <laughs> basic geometry here, can show that this angle right here is also equal to theta, which basically means this side length is a cosine theta. So the flux, the number of uh, <coughs> cubic meters per second, the water flux, for our example here, cubic meters per second. Whatever our quantity here should have those same units. So what might be something that gives us those same units? Well, if I take a velocity and multiply it by an area, I do have cubic meters per second, right? Um, or it's measuring a, a flow rate here. So A cosine theta multiplied by V is going to measure the amount per unit time that flows through the hoop. And since we like, since vectors are very useful in physics, we can write this as a dot product, right? If A vector and V vector are in the same direction or the angle is zero, you have maximum flux. If they're at 90 degrees, you have zero flux. Okay, so in a very similar way, the electric flux is not measuring the flow of water, the streamlines of water as it flows through the river, but it's measuring the degree to which electric field lines penetrate a surface. Yes, yes. Okay, so the electric flux is just E dot A. measures how much electric field penetrates through a surface. Now that's for the electric field that's constant. And what we can do here is if the electric field is not constant, or it varies, we have to break into tiles and add up. So the electric flux due to a little tile, let's imagine this flow right here changes over the surface of the area. Well, what we would do here is we would break that surface up into a bunch of little tiles and we add up all those tiles. So what that becomes is E, electric flux through a little tile, D, phi sub e is going to be e dot it into a little tile. So the total electric flux phi sub e is going to be integrating d phi sub e over the area of the loop. And area is two dimensions, so this is a double integral. 
So we add up tiles, <coughs> and we get a surface integral. <coughs> So, is everyone familiar with surface integrals from calculus? Raise your hand if you're not familiar with surface integrals from calculus. All right, raise your hand if you are familiar with surface integrals from calculus. So it's kind of 50-50. All right, now the good news is, is we're just doing basic surface integrals in this class. Uh, right, now the idea of a surface integral is, instead of integrating over a flat plane, you integrate over a surface, and the surface could potentially be any shape. So for example, this hoop, right, if it was a circular hoop, the cross-section of that hoop could just be a tight rubber membrane that's flat, right? But you could also imagine that uh, you change the shape of that hoop, where you now blow into that membrane, and then you freeze it in a different shape, right? So you could kind of distort, the edge stays the same, right? but uh, you've basically blown some air into it and it's kind of made some different shape. Kind of like the way they make uh, glass, hot glass by blowing air into it and then shaping it on a, on a spindle. So the area in that case would be kind of very complicated. You'd be, you know, or in the case of the, the fishing analogy here with the net, uh, the net would make any shape, you know, it, would have, it wouldn't just necessarily be completely flat on the boundary, right? It would kind of, it would have a particular shape. Um, so you'd have to integrate the electric field over the shape of the net. That's what a surface integral is. Yes? Yeah, you, I think you just answered it. But like the area is, the, is would you consider the, that the area of that net, like the area of that whole, the whole net surface? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the area is really the area of the net, not the, the boundary defines kind of the edge uh -huh. of it. But it could be, there could be any shape, two-dimensional shape. Um, that's just founded by uh, the area. Okay. Yes? So how would you go about doing a double integral? So what we will, theory, right? yeah, now if you take a, uh, well, in calculus you'll do some advanced, well, depending on which calculus courses you take, you'll, you know, you'll look at some techniques for advanced you know, surface integrals. The ones that we use in this class are relatively simple. We just need to be familiar mostly just with the concept of a surface integral. Um, if I was, Again, so here is, here is my, and I'm going to try to draw this three-dimensionally now, because here is kind of the downward view, but that's the edge of the net, right? But the net could have some shape like that. Now, what you're doing when you do the surface integral is you're saying, all right, here's a little piece of the net. There's a little area, and that little area has a vector which is going to be normal to the surface of the net. Right? And now your velocity vector at that point, if it's a non-constant flow, it could be, you know, you could have a velocity like this at that point. So you measure how much flux there is through a tiny little tile. That's just the e dot dA, and then you add up all the tiles over the surface of of, of the net. Okay. Now to, for some really complicated surface, you'd have to parameterize the surface, and uh, there's a whole bunch of techniques on how to do this uh, in calculus. But the point here is not to do a really complicated surface, it's just to be familiar with the concept of, of, uh, of uh, electric, uh, the concept of uh, flux. <clears throat> and then we'll use some of those ideas to solve some uh, problems. All right, so let's take out your voting cards. And I want you to look at the following question here. <coughs> For a uniform electric field, through which surface is the electric flux uh, largest? All right, and on the count of three, let's see your vote. All right, very good. It is the square. There's more field going through the square. And the reason for that is, if I look at a square versus a circle, it's basically here. It's just because we have this extra little bit that's cap cap basically cap capturing more of those lines. Right? It's a uniform flow. 
All right, what about the following uh, example? So here's kind of that balloon net that I was talking about. Let's say that uh, surface number one is flat. It's just the flat part here. And then surface number two is a nice spherical kind of uh, 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 curve like this. So through which of those balloon, well, which of those surfaces, I should say, is going to have the uh, maximum uh, flux? Give you a moment to prepare your vote. Okay, and on three, two, one. Okay, there's a little bit of disagreement here. I want you to argue with your neighbor about trying to convince them by giving them an argument. I don't mean to uh, quarrel with them, but uh, give them an argument. How do these factors affect your answer to this question? Disagreement here. But let's let's discuss this one. Now, the, there's there's the three factors which determine flex, right? Area, speed, and orientation. Now, it's true. Surface two has a larger area, but also has a different orientation. So, for example, uh, if I was looking at a little tile of the curved surface that's down here, there's really no flex through that tile, right? But there's sort of maximum flex through the tile that's right here because it's parallel. The area vector would be parallel to the flow. And then everywhere in between, it's sort of somewhere in between. Now, so two has a larger area, right? But not all of those area elements have the same amount of flux through, through them. So it turns out the answer is C. The flux is the same, right? Because what's important here is, is really the boundary, right? Um, when we look at these three uh, different factors here. Uh, yes? Is this surface charged, or is it in a much? So this is just a, this is just a net, just a surface, right? And then the the lines here are just field lines that are flowing or penetrating through this surface or this net, right? So we call this a we call this a Gaussian net or a Gaussian surface. And um, in one thing to note here is if we look at electric flux versus water flux, the field lines aren't really flowing, right? Uh, in the sense that nothing's actually moving for a static charge distribution. Those lines are static, right? But they're still, flux is still the measure to the degree to which they are, are penetrating that surface. But it's not flowing in the same sense the uh, water is. Now, a water vector field, you can have, a ve you can have various vector fields. You can, have, you can have wind vector field. That just means that the air particles are actually following these streamlines. Um, there's a vector assigned to every point in space. Electric field assigns a vector to every point in space, but there's nothing moving. There's, you know, it's, there's nothing moving along those lines. Okay, so the idea is the same, but the interpretation is a little bit different. It's not actually a uh, electric flux is not a, a flow in the sense something is moving. So those factors play into why uh, they are the same here. Really, when we consider uh, these three options here, the speed is the same. Right now, two has a larger area, but some of the orientations produce little or no flux. So basically, since the field, whatever comes in, is equal to what's really going out, um, 
We have the same amount of flux here, yes. Uh, so if you're <coughs> calculating this using these equations, one would correspond with the constant electric field and two would correspond with the non-constant? Uh, two would still be a constant electric field, but the area vector would be, the, the surface integral would be harder to do for number two. Because now you wouldn't be integrating over, uh, if you have done multivariable calculus, right, you might integrate surface number one over a, in the xy plane, you might just integrate over the circle, right? That would be your, that would be your boundary for number one. For number two, it's still a two-dimensional integral, but it's, it's like this, right? So it's a, the electric field is constant over that surface, but the surface is changing its orientation. Sorry, just yes. follow up. If the electric field is constant and you use the formula for the non-constant, when would you use the formula for the constant? Oh, I see what you're saying. So, yeah, they're constant for both. So this is for a, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so non-constant electric field, or I should write here, or a non-flat surface. Because the surface, the surface, the surface here, this is either, this is constant electric field and flat surface. Yeah, good, good, good question. Thank you to clarify that. Yes? Um, this is, I guess, kind of nitpicky. So non-constant electric field or non-flat surface, or I guess non-uniform surface, can be both a non-constant electric field and a non-uniform surface, would that take that into account as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it could be. It could be um, either your electric field is changing, your surface is curved, or both. But for E dot A, electric flux, both you have to have a flat surf. Well, a flat surface. I mean, it could be at an angle, right? Um, and the electric field through that surface has to be constant. Yes. So is speed in the water analogy referring to the <coughs> magnitude of the electric field in the electric flux? So you're saying if I put an E right here? No, 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 speed, I'm sorry, speed. Like, it depends on speed. Yeah, so that, exactly, that would be magnitude of the uh, E field. Okay. Because the water field is describing a vector velocity field. But the electric field is not a velocity field, it's an electric field, but it's still a vector field um, uh, in three space. All right, good. Any other questions, clarification questions here? All right, so let me talk about something now I want to call a closed surface. So a closed surface A closed surface, uh, we can calculate the electric flux through a closed surface as, well, the same thing, double integral E dot dA, but I put a little circle there. And that circle is <coughs> what we mean, or is to indicate that the surface is closed. And in a sense, the picture that I have on the board right here is a closed surface. If we just picture that as a solid object, it would be, what, mathematically, what a closed surface is, is it means it's impossible to get from inside the surface to outside the surface without penetrating the surface. Yeah, or, or, or basically, if it's a big rubber balloon, you have to poke it to go in. That's what a closed surface is. So let's look at the following example. So it is flux plus, minus, or zero. So let's, let's go back to our cylinder example here. <coughs> okay, so I put a positive charge to the left of a cylinder. I want you to prepare your vote here. 
the question I'm asking you, is the flux <coughs> through the closed cylinder, how many sides does the cylinder have, by the way? Three sides. So you really have to add up the flux on three different sides here. Is the flux through that cylinder positive, negative, or zero? Take a moment to think about this individually, and then we'll take a vote. All right, prepare your vote. And on the count of three, three, two, one. Okay. Take a moment, convince your neighbor what the correct answer must be. We have a little bit of A's, B's, and C's here. On the count of three, two, one. Okay, there's a big split between A's and C's with a couple of B's floating around as well. All right, well, let's draw the electric field. Let's, let's just discuss this, because if I was to draw the electric field due to the, due to the plus charge, we could sketch it as follows. Now this front surface would correspond to a positive or negative flux. This front surface would correspond to a negative flux. Now the reason for this is, so we're going to, uh, for a closed surface, the area vector uh, points outwards. So. <clears throat> this is something we didn't know yet, but it wouldn't change the answer to this question. This is just sort of a convention. If you have a closed surface, the, uh, the, the area vector is always going to point outwards. So since the flow is pointing in, the area vector is pointing out, the front surface is, the front circle is uh, negative flux, right? What about the curved side of the cylinder, would that correspond to positive or negative flux? Positive. positive flux, because the area vector, as you go around the surface of the cylinder, is always like this, right? And the electric field, for instance, at this point, points like this, but the area vector for this little tile right there would point upwards, so that angle between them is less than 90 degrees, so we have a positive flux on the curved surface of the cylinder. And then on the right edge of the cylinder, is that positive or negative flux? Positive, right? Because the flow, well, the area vector, so area vector and the electric field point in the same direction. Well, at least for the field line that I drew there, not all of them, some of them are going to be uh, kind of more complicated down here. Um, now, so this is positive flux. So this surface right here is plus. <coughs> this surface right here is also plus. And this surface right here is negative. So I guess the answer could really be any of them. It just depends on which one of them is larger. Now, the answer is zero. Right? And the way to think about this is the line that pokes in here, 
to give you negative flux pokes out over there. Right. Uh, the field, the positive charge is the source of the field lines, and those field lines are diverging or spreading out from the positive charge. But this closed surface, you know, to do this surface integral would be kind of would be complicated. All right, to mathematically set up this expression, prove it zero, that's a complicated expression. You can do it, right? We could do it mathematically, but physically we can make the argument it has to be zero because whatever entered here has to exit. If you think about it in terms of water, uh, that helps make a little more sense there. One more question, then we'll end here. It doesn't deteriorate because field lines begin on positive charges. Positive charges are sources and they end on negative charges, which are sinks. So the field lines can either uh, diverge, or they can spread out, or they can converge, but they can't evaporate, right? It's kind of like uh, the line, the electric field lines, if I have a bunch of spaghetti, if I have a bunch of uh, rubber bands that are under tension and they're spreading out, Right? Those rubber bands don't deteriorate, but they might be kind of spread out as you get farther and farther away from where they're all tied at the knot at the center. All right, all right so we will continue with Gauss's Law on Monday, and, by, and, and then I'll put your homework for this chapter up on Polylearn. So it'll be due next Friday. Turn in your homework for chapter 28, up at the front. So a surface. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you look at the uh, 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 well, if I was, if I had a wait, 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 I, if I want to do the integral here, I would be trying to flux here. I would be integrating yeah. the electric field. I don't have a stable work. Oh, the cost is actually taking the top product. And in fact, in fact, it's a circle in the sky. Polar coordinates, we have a R, we are in the data. It's a double integral. And we're integrating all the circles. Right from 0 to R and from 0 to 2 pi. This is the case when it's flash. Right? If it's curved. So if it's curved, let's say the surface has, let's say we want to cut the flux through that curved surface. Well, in this case, what I have to do is it's still a double integral. I have E as a vector, I have to dot that into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in order to, so that's just a generic expression yeah, here. <laughs> but what this means is, what I have to do is I have to parameterize this. a that So your area vector is going to depend on where you are in three dimensions, right? It's going to, your area vector is going to be a function of x, y, and z. So you're parameterizing it in a particular pointing system. And then at each of those little points, you're uh, taking the electric field, dotting it into that little, back that little point, and then adding them all up. Now, we could, so a calculus class will take you know, you go into really how to do this, right, through a lot of examples. Um, we won't be doing that in this class, but that's that's the idea of what a surface integral is. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so, that's So the negative flux. Yeah. So 
If I, do you know? Now, a field line, yes. Are you a field line is yeah. really a representation. Okay. I like what um, you might ask how big is a field line. Right? Now, mathematically, no, it's just five to six, I'm infinitesimal in its width. It's really small. So technically, Maybe that area back there is yeah, zero. Still work out really. For that field line, so we really have a zero area vector here and a zero are you, area vector here. Um, but the point is, is that this line, it doesn't evaporate. It comes in and it comes out. So this is a yeah. representation of the field. But uh, when we since the field, since there's no charge in the field, whatever it came in, it had to come out. It had to also go I know. That's what my exactly Oh, uh, <laughs> Well, I just put a negative charge in there. Okay. Well, in this case, you can take a negative, but if I just put a negative charge in there, okay. well, in case, you you charge in there. Okay. all the lines would be Yeah, minus the four day a week. I would rather just like, do two dollars. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. English is literally like a 30 minute class. So, and then we can just get out so quick. Yeah. When I, when I saw it at a 46, I'm like, oh, that's so good. And it just wasn't decided. Exactly. All three surfaces would have. Excellent. Yeah, they just have positive effects. Oh, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, so no problem at all. And like, probably, I normally, like, I can be on top of the one that I could Yes. Yeah, it's so much more. Yeah, and like, and I'm just like, yeah, it's so bad. And we're trying to work on our face. Dude, my sister presents like two weeks ago, and this was no one's there. Wait, how? Why did you guys? Like last weekend, one person like going to Western Day. This is gonna be hot. Yeah, this one girl was like, you just need to see her. And he like, 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 oh shit. I looked around and everyone's so nervous. I'm actually kidding. Yeah. That's why I I saw Coke in the bed for the first time in my life. I have not, because I've heard it. That's why I'm here. I'm kind of salty because last time I said, let's go to the beach, and Clinton said, yes, and then did the same. Wait, I'm not going to do 